welcome everyone. I'm going to try to quickly get into this. My name is Jennifer Dill. I'm a professor at Portland State University and also director of the Transportation Research and Education Center there at Portland State. And um, I, my purpose here is uh, purely to moderate and direct our uh, discussion. So we're going to be talking about the future for the next short-term future, the next five years at the federal level for uh, bicycling and walking. Um, we're going to start out uh, with Dan Goodman, who's a transportation specialist with the livability team at Federal Highway Administration, and he's going to update us and talk about FHWA's strategic agenda for pedestrian and bicycle transportation. And then we have, uh, joining Dan, we have three uh, panelists that will engage in the discussion. Um, representing NACTA, the National Association of City Transportation Officials, uh, we have a substitution. We have Margie Bradway, who is the Active Transportation and Safety Division Manager for the City of Portland, who is a NACTA member. Um, so Margie is going to be drawing on NACTO experience as well as the City of Portland in, in the discussion. We have Ken McLeod, the State and Local Policy Manager for the League of American Bicycles. And we have Heidi Simon, the Communications and Public Affairs Manager for America Walks. Um, so again, Dan's going to start out. Everyone will have some response, and then I have a series of questions I'm going to pose to the group. And then we are going to um, let all of you ask some questions as well. As well. But given our limited time, um, we are going to ask you to write your questions down. And our two room um, helpers um, have some paper they can give you, and they'll be collecting the pieces of paper. And then I'm going to try to select the questions that will move our discussion forward into some new topic areas. So, and given the crowd and that we now only have 40 minutes left, we're going to get started. Dan. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, everybody, for, for joining us here for this session today. Uh, my name is Dan Goodman. I work at Federal Highway Administration. I'm, I'm joined by my colleague, Christopher Dallas, in the corner. Um, what I want to do is, is talk about FHWA strategic agenda for pedestrian and bicycle transportation. This is a document that Administrator Greg Mendeau announced at his keynote address yesterday at the, the lunch session. Um, or I guess it was in the morning yesterday. Um, but this is a, the strategic agenda is a really important document for FHWA. What it's doing is laying out what we intend to focus on for the next three to five years. So it's very action-oriented. It has a short, a relatively short um, time horizon. Um, and the purpose is really to provide structure around all the stuff that's happening now, uh, and then to give you all an indication of what we're going to be working on in the future. Um, the, the sort of theme at the end of my talk um, is that we're, we want to work on it together. So I think that what you'll find is that FHWA is a willing partner to solve the, the problems that we still have to solve um, in the next, in the near to medium term. And, and, and we're moving with urgency, and I hope that, that you see that in our work. Um, so the strategic agenda, um, we developed it in partnership with ICF, uh, Portland State, Sprinkle, and Alta. Um, we did a real detailed look at data, research, training, and ladders. Um, ladders of opportunity and, and really what we came up with at the end of the day and what you'll see in the document is four primary goals that are going to be that are going to be providing the structure for what we do in the next three to five years the goals are networks safety equity and trips um, within each goal we've got four different action types so we're going to have capacity building policy data and research we're going to be doing things in those four action types in all four goals um, concurrently over the next few years. Two things I want to point out that are really important in the document. Number one, we're setting the aspirational goal um, that we want to see an 80% reduction in pedestrian bicycle fatalities um, in the next 15 years, and that we want to get to zero in the next 20 to 30 years. And that's a, a really important step for FHWA to make. Um, the other aspirational goal that we're setting is that we want to see a 50% increase in short trips in the next, uh, by 2025. 
We're focusing specifically on short trips for, for strategic reasons. Uh, so, so I'm going to run through some of the actions that are in the strategic agenda document, and I'm, I have limited time, so I'm not going to cover everything. Um, I would encourage you to look at the document and spend time with the document because there are there is a lot of information in there that is um, worthy of kind of being aware of and following up on. Um, so number one, we're going to be building capacity. As you've seen, we've been putting out a lot of resources in FHWA, um, and we know that we're getting to a point where we're going to need to transition and really make sure that we're building capacity so that our partners and stakeholders at the local level, the MPO level, and the state DOT level are all aware of those resources and they're using them to inform their day-to-day -day work. Um, one of the things that we're going to continue focusing on is building collaboration between FHWA, ASHTO, and TRB and the NCHRP process. We've made good strides in that and we're going to continue to focus on that. Um, we're focusing on measuring network connectivity. So I said one of our goals is to encourage the development of connected pedestrian and bicycle networks. One of the things that we acknowledge is if we're going to do that, we need a good way to actually document how connected is my network now um, and how has it changed over time. And that's something that we're really going to be focusing on. Um, as you've heard, we now have non-motorized measures in the same, as a result of the, the safety performance measure final rule. It now includes non-motorized measures. And so we're going to be focusing on the implementation of that final rule and working with the state DOTs and MPOs as they start to collect that information as part of the new requirement. Um, we're also going to keep doing the really important stuff that we're doing right now, which is focus on the focus cities and focus states. Um, that's a, that's a, a big effort on our part to really improve pedestrian and bicycle safety at the local and the state level. So what are some new things that we're doing? And I'm just going to pick a few things that I'm particularly excited about that I want to make sure you know about. So, so we're going to focus on implementation and innovation at the state level. We recognize that a lot of innovation is happening at the, at the city level, and now we need to kind of transition and see more of that happening at the state level. And FHWA has a role to play um, in that. Um, we're going to push on network infrastructure data. That's a really important piece. As we try to solve the measuring network connectivity piece, we also need to solve the network infrastructure piece. How are we tracking it? What are the data attributes? How are we making sure that it's consistent across jurisdictions? Um, we've got a new coordinating committee um, at USDOT, which we're announcing, that, we, that will serve to kind of continue the really important work of the Pedestrian Device and Safety Action Team, which is the team of FHWA and NHTSA and FTA and the Office of the Secretary um, that have been implementing the Secretary of Safer People, Safer Streets initiative and the Mayor's Challenge. That's going to continue into the future, which is really important. We're going to focus on education and encouragement um, with NHTSA, with our partners at NHTSA. Um, we're also going to create a new transportation pool research fund, which is a very important thing. Um, this is going to be a mechanism that helps us get more research done faster um, and get the answers into the hands of practitioners um, on a short turnaround time. A, a transportation pool fund enables, it's a mechanism to allow cities and MPOs and states and even partner organizations such as NACO and FHWA as well to put money on the table um, in a jointly funded way, again, to answer questions that are of immediate relevance. This is a new thing that we're going to create. Um, we're focusing on connected vehicles. Um, we're focusing on spending down our safe routes to school administrative funds that still exist. Um, we're updating TMAPS, which is the database that houses motor vehicle data. We're updating that, and very soon, for the first time ever, it's going to have the ability to receive pedestrian and bicycle volume data into that national database, which is um, a very important advancement. We're also going to be working with the UTC, the University Transportation Center. So we've got a conference actually next month where all the transportation centers are going to come together, um, specifically in their spotlight conference, specifically on pedestrian and bicycle safety. So we're all going to get together and talk about the research that needs to be done um, on bike pen safety. Uh, we're also going to be focusing on accessibility. One of the things that we recognize is that as we see all this innovation in roadway design, um, there's a need to be continuing to think about how are the needs of people with disabilities um, served in this innovative infrastructure that we're seeing on the ground. So that's something that, that we're going to be focusing on. We're focusing on right-sizing and streamlining. So one of the things that 
we're going to work with the ASHTO Center for Environmental Excellence, a, part between, a partnership between FHWA and ASHTO, to really think about how do we streamline pedestrian and bicycle projects and how do we get more on the ground faster. That's really going to be an important conversation that we have. Another important conversation is how do we build capacity amongst the pedestrian bicycle coordinators at the local level, at the state DOT level, um, and at the FHWA division office level. One thing that, that we're going to create in the immediate term is a resource that we can hand somebody. When they've just gotten the job as the, the state DOT pedestrian bicycle coordinator, we want to be able to hand them a, do a packet of information that says, OK, congratulations on your new job. This is what you need to know. Um, and that's going to be, I think, a really helpful resource that a state DOT coordinator can use, but also a local pedestrian bicycle coordinator, or just you know, a member of the engineering staff also can, can use that information. Um, federal lands access is another key thing that we're going to be focusing on because we see a direct linkage between pedestrian and bicycle transportation and access to federal lands, and we want to cultivate that. Um, that relationship between walking and biking and access to all federal lands for everyone. Um, we're also going to keep working with uh, the Dutch government. We, I mean, we've had a really kind of fruitful dialogue between the U.S. government, the Federal Highway Administration, and our, and our counterparts in the Netherlands. We're going to keep that up. Um, as one example, we're funding two Think Bike workshops next month, one in Detroit and one in Milwaukee. Um, and that builds on a successful Think Bike event that we that we um, funded earlier this spring in Washington, D.C. Um, so with that, in closing, I know we, we are short on time, but um, I guess I want to close by saying that all of these activities, um, we want to partner with you all. Everybody in this room is going to have a role in, in all those different um, activities that I described, and that we're certainly not going to achieve the aspirational goals that we lay out in the strategic agenda um, without kind of an ongoing partnership between FHWA uh, and all of our partners and stakeholders for the next three to five years. So. Okay, I know a lot of people have joined us. There's still at least one seat up here. And then also I'm going to ask our, and raise your hand if there's a seat next to you. And then um, we're going to ask you to write down your questions. And I'm guessing that Dan prompted a lot of questions. So um, we've got a couple of folks here with paper. Raise your hand if you want some paper to write a question down. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. And then, um, so now I'm just going to first let the three other panelists um, quickly, or briefly, I should say, uh, respond and give your organization's perspective. And, and let's start at the other end with Heidi Simon from American Blocks. I get to go first. Yes.
training and capacity building for engineers and planners who might not already be at this conference that need to be fluent in Python and blocking in the same way that all the people attending here are. Great. Uh, Margie Bradway, NACTA and City of Portland. Hi. Hello. Okay. Microphone testing. Um, yeah, I'm excited about everything that you've said, and um, I'm really <coughs> excited to see this leadership coming from FHWA. Uh, it, it has the potential to have a huge impact on what's going on on the ground. And uh, particularly, you know, of the, of the six things you mentioned, uh, focus on connectivity, really important, uh, consistent, you know, with NACTO and the contact sensitive design and complete streets. At the city level, uh, our trouble spots, it are those arterials that are either owned by the DOT or FHWA, and that connection for our local network is key for both pedestrian and, uh, and cycling. And so that for me was uh, probably the most exciting, as well as a focus on safety, which is consistent with the conversation going on with Vision Zero, and that has been hugely supportive of that in the Vision Zero network. And then the third thing is really equity, which I think, you know, coming into the the, the topic of today coming into the future really uh, <coughs> with what does that mean and how do we do it well and uh, I think again, the actors kind of try to uh, set some cities up for success and recently are doing some work with people for bikes and bike share which is very helpful and city part of one of those grants um, and we'd love to work with FHWA and then, lastly above all is the implementation and uh, and wearing my city hat, where, where the rub comes is with you know the, the DOT person who's been assigned the federal grant that comes to us, whether it's a CMAC or a TAP grant, and that's where those hand to hand battles happen. Shouldn't be battles, but they do. They do, I'm just being real, and it's a and we really need that education and, and training and shared understanding really to get past the hand to hand battles at the, at the ground level where those federal laws are passed off. So I'm glad to see your including the implementation here. Thanks for getting us started. And that actually segues well to our first um, prepared question, which is what role do you see this federal agenda playing in relation to state and local government efforts to improve walking and bicycling as well as advocacy organizations. And I think Margie, you just touched on that. And you know, Ken, if you want to add to that relationship between the federal down to the states and locals that you're working with. Yeah, I think the federal government's been doing a lot of great things recently. Um, and you know, as, as advocates, we are wanting to work with the state and local level to kind of make sure that the state and local governments are aware of those resources, um, that those best practices are being passed on, um, and that you know, throughout the nation, there's not a great disparity between what one state DOT is doing and doing providing more than what another state DOT is doing. Um, I think the federal government has a great role in kind of equalizing that knowledge in the playing field, and so every state or every locality can make the best practices easily, um, and knowing that Yeah, I would say in addition to you know, equalizing the, the resources and the knowledge and the best practices, there's also the, the equalizing of priorities um, as to what state and local um, governments and advocates should be, should be focusing on and, and knowing that they're going to build themselves so much their goals. Well. Margie, yes. Yeah, I, I think the, uh, again, I'm, I'm hyper focused on funding. If you know me, that's just who I am. And uh, really taking a close look at those constraints on federal funding and how they're laid out. So, uh, HSIP funding, a huge opportunity for safety money that was available to both the DOTs and the locals, at least in my state, um, have received the implementation plan. Is that right? And uh, that was a huge opportunity at uh, City Court to get HSIP money, but there's only nine proven countermeasures, which a lot of people in this room are probably familiar with. And I think it was a missed opportunity for us. We know road diets work. A lot of this is kind of you're going to have to take a harder look at those funding sources, a harder look at some of your other guidelines to really allow that innovation at the local level. Do you want to add? Uh, yeah, sorry, sorry. I don't know. I think it's, it's all 
Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, since so speed came up, and it was one of the questions that came up again, and clearly it's a big priority, I'm just going to ask, particularly from um, our national organizations, um, are you optimistic in the near term that something can be done about this, or what needs to change to address the issue? Um, uh, optimistic might be a yeah, word. Optimistic word. Um, but you know, there, there are states that have changed their laws to allow uh, cities to set lower speed limits. Oregon and Washington have allowed uh, lower speed limits. New York changed its law to New York City. I mean, Boston has got approvals to change lower speed limits. So there, there's some uh, traction in the movement, and hopefully that's a, a good sign of things to come. Uh, so cautiously optimistic. Uh, I would echo that and say it's huge from the individual advocate standpoint. I think people are a little bit more comfortable saying they want lower speed limits and why they want lower speed limits. Um, I think you're seeing a lot of campaigns built around that um, that hopefully will also drive it from a grassroots effort. Um, so that maybe they can change it. Okay, switching um, gears just a little bit. One of the Secretary's priorities um, has been ladders of opportunity with a focus on improved access for people of all incomes, races, ethnic backgrounds. What do we need to do as organizations and public agencies to have a more equitable environment for cycling and walking? Um, for us as an organization, it's changing who we are bringing to the table as part of the process that you know, people who haven't been engaged are engaged and that um, they are providing the valuable input that they have. And it's also looking at broader definitions of what we talked about. So when we're talking about safety, it's not just physical safety, being able to walk, but also perceived safety and making places that people actually want to walk and be physically active um, and expanding some of the ways that we're, we're looking at these issues. Yeah, I think we definitely need to engage groups that we haven't engaged before and make sure that people who have them on the table are at the table. Um, I think there's also, we've been talking about the national level, but we're going to the local. Um, we need to make sure that we also are helping people engage at the local level um, in places they haven't necessarily engaged before and kind of broader that uh, space coming up to the national level. Yeah, I'll uh, tell a uh, antidote from the perspective of our smart city team. We were city probably was one of the smart cities on the list uh, all the way in when uh, we had a good application. We heard we were talking. Um, we, uh, so our team, which was very diverse and had everybody from, you know, the automated vehicle folks to the signal timing folks to the bike type folks in the room. And we said, okay, we have to address the ladders of opportunity. This is, this is a criteria. It's part of this application. So we lay out the map and everybody kind of starts pointing and I was like, oh, you know, this, this corridor, this corridor connects to, you know, the low income corridor, connects to the airport, it connects to these things. And immediately it became how this corridor meets our our freight needs, right? And so, but it, it was also in an area of communities of concern. And we really had to call the question, well, is that what they meant, right? Getting freight, like, let's let's check this real quick and say, this is this is more about just providing mobility in this. This is what they're accessing. In order to try to figure out what access means, we have to go ask the community what they need to access, right? And what they need to access is a grocery store. What they need to access is the, is the school on the other side that is frankly, on a freight route on the opposite of that grocery store. And so I think Ladders of Opportunity really is having that conversation with the community. Don't be presumptuous about what you think, where they work, or where you think they might go to ask, um, and, and frame your proposal that way or your, your project that way. Yeah, I think that's great. And it's, it's a great segue for me to make a plug for Community Connections, which is uh, a new EDC4 initiative from FHWA. So EDC, EDC is Everyday Counts. It is one of the main mechanisms that we have at the national level to push innovation across the country. Uh, and Community Connections is the way that we're going to institutionalize ladders of opportunity in the next couple of years. Uh, it's a huge opportunity um, to engage in EDC because there are a lot of resources behind it. Uh, what I would encourage the folks in this room is, 
when that discussion happens at your state, there's a whole slate of potential topics that you can choose through EDC. Somebody at that table has to advocate for the community connection board uh, in order to really have the equity um, conversation through EDC board. Um, your state needs to pick community connections. I also advocate for the step one, the one on pedestrian crossings. So there's really two that I would push as part of EDC for uh, step and community connections. Step right. stands for uh, safe transportation for every pedestrian. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Dan, when you were talking about the agenda and implementation steps, you categorized them. I think I got them all. Capacity building data and research. So for our panel. What's one research question that you think we need to answer soon that's going to help propel this agenda? Um, I'll, I'll go with the kind of exposure and millimeter uh, problem. Uh, we don't really know how many people are biking through. We don't know how many people are crafting for prices. Uh, if we can solve that for research, then we can learn that. Uh, that's a huge step to Sansita, uh, I would say better data on what interventions work and why they work. Um, really looking at you know, some of those critical pieces that communities at the local level or even state level can put in place to have a really great impact on reducing the numbers at the state. Uh, I find it's not so much a research topic as a framing topic. <coughs> Uh, although this is a panel about biking and walking, we do have a fairly narrow view to look at you know, what is the question presented in terms of what would make a pedestrian safety. And I would argue that in the future, and that really there are a lot of things you can do to make our streets safer for all modes. And to the extent we continue to bring it as a bicycle, a more pedestrian thing, uh, you know, to put a rapid flashing beacon in across an arterial, that is good for bicyclists, crossing as the best. Awesome. It's also good for the car to just slow down and it has multiple benefits. So I guess just more research and more framing around multimodal benefits and so we don't pigeonhole sort of, uh, ourselves in our thinking. If I, if I can just add on the exposure topic, we're actually working with Sean Turner at the Texas Transportation Institute. I saw him here yesterday. I don't I think he might have left today. Uh, but we're, we're working with Sean, and we, we have a, a, a big research effort underway uh, that we think is going to solve this question. It's going to take a little while, uh, but it's underway, and it's funded, and it's happening right now. Okay, I'm going to jump into some of these great questions that have been feeding up here, um, and, the, and I'm going to shorten things a little bit. So the first is, what are the plans? Um, and the vision and goals for rural communities. There's a sense that this sounds very urban, suburban. What about rural communities? Uh, I, will, I will say that we are, this fall, towards the end of this year, we're going to publish a document called Multimodal Networks in Small Town and Rural Communities. It's going to be a, a roadway design guide targeted specifically in, on rural areas and building pedestrian and bicycle networks in a rural land use setting. Um, so that's the main thing we're going to do is put out that document and then promote it um, and work with people to uh, We have efforts in place to identify best practices for rural and suburban communities and walking walkability. Um, and the hope is that through some of our existing programs, taking greater focus on those types of communities um, to specify what can be done and, and ways to improve um, their environments. Um, we've had a lot of rural communities apply to be recognized as bicycle-friendly communities, and they're seeing it as an economic development um, thing, so they get the designation to promote themselves and have people come to their area and, and bike around. Um, I think there's also a great work being done on the U.S. bicycle route system to really help make uh, long-distance bicycling in rural areas possible. Great. Okay. Next, um, have a few questions here that are getting at sort of consistency uh, and getting all the different agencies from FHWA to the state DOTs um, sort of on board and the same message. So for example, 
Um, we hear different stories from FHWA, BC, and state division offices. How do we build that consistency? And how do we how do we integrate this from what Dan, you're telling us throughout the whole agency? And so you can respond, but also I'd like if the rest of the panelists have examples that they've seen of successes in this area. Yeah, and particularly like one example here is we hear different stories from FHWA, DC, and the state division offices. How do we get that to be consistent? So, so one way. Did you get Dan here? You got it. Yeah. 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 Um, joint conversations between the state DOT pedestrian bicycle coordinator and the FHWA division office pedestrian bicycle point of contact. So that's a really uh, important way that we're trying to build that conversation. Uh, but we also recognize that it still could only be going one down one side of the silo of or the organization, and there's other silos that, that really need the information. So one thing we did when we put out a resurfacing guide recently uh, we asked our division administrator to send it straight to the person in charge of asset management in the state DOT, um, rather than just sending it to the pedestrian bicycle coordinator. So I think I think we need to do more of that. Um, we could use your help because every state is different, uh, but we need to do more targeted outreach of the right resource to the right person. Any examples of success you've observed in this area? No. I can, I can, I can, uh, I can get examples. Success, hello, my yes. And I think, um, and I know I've been beating up on FHWA, so sorry. Uh, but we, we actually do have a really 